anyway, so the, um, the point of my talk when we get started is actually going to be about how we practically approach engineering systems um, with humans in the loop, messy systems, real world systems, systems with temporal dynamics. Um, in these discussions so far, we've really talked about ideas and stories and really well fleshed out ideas conceptually that we haven't really tested in the real world. And so I'm going to talk about how we use some of my favorite you know, communal protocols, science and engineering, to actually move forward and sort of what it means to do so responsibly. We're going to try one more time with the slides. <laughs> um, cool. Well, we're going to let someone else control the flow then. So the goal of this is to create com interconnected communities of autonomous local actors within which global coordination is enabled by technology. I will note that global co coordination here does not imply homogeneity. We talked briefly in the previous um, fireside about sort of the need for intermediate levels of um, sort of groupings and behaviors. Um, in general here, when I talk about global coordination, I'm, I'm talking about some like low dimensional you know, notion of, sort of collective well-being, which is maybe a co characterized by the sort of flow of, of property between people or what the definition of communal property would be in the case of the radical markets ideas. Here I'm not specifying anything about what that global coordination is. I'm just considering cases where we care about global coordination as an idea. Um, so we can move forward with slides. Um, this is where things get really messy. Like, we have closed loop systems with humans, human behavior, human changing the nature of the world through the creation of the internet, through the creations of these platforms, through the creation of smart contracts. And in fact, at this point, we're changing the way the world works. And then we are participating in that world. And then we're changing the way that the world works. And we're participating in that world. And as it turns out, we've kind of tightened down the loop on here. this. Like, in the last 10 to 20 years, I would say, the rate at which we do things, the change the way that our world works, which in turn changes the way that we behave, has actually accelerated quite readily. Um, and so we really need to have a better means of understanding the impact of what we do um, so that we can do it more um, mindfully. And um, the focus from my work has actually been very much how we take the understanding that we have from the analysis and engineering of sort of these decentralized you know, robotic systems, optimization systems, um, operations research systems, and actually bring it to bear in our sort of newfound capacity for sort of changing the way that the rules work. Um, in the space, the blockchain space in particular, I like to, um, we, can, we can roll forward. Um, we, I like, to, well, I guess I should work off the slides. So basically, I like to t point out that there's a high degree of overlap between fields. The things that they have in common are very much the ability to do science with data associated with some decision making processes associated with the way that the world works. Um, and in part by staying all techy and only thinking in terms of optimization and automation and control, or even just finance and economics, if we don't also pay attention to the sort of biological-like sort of flows of information or the actual human experiences associated with um, the way that we engage with our world, even when it's ostensibly irrational, don't particularly like even thinking in terms of rationality, it implies there's one right answer to begin with, which arguably your objective is itself a subjective choice. Um, we kind of have to have this holistic view of what it means to operate in this world, and we have a lot of fields from which we can take knowledge, experience, analogies, use data, um, and even build things and sort of observe the way that uh, human behavior changes. We can roll forward. Um, I tend to break the world down in terms of bands instead of silos. The very natural perspective is to sort of look at things in terms of technology and in terms of social behavior and in terms of economics or even the physical plant of the world in terms of moving goods, providing services. And we actually kind of have to step away from slicing things into silos and think of it in terms of bands if we want to have holistic solutions. Um, this sort of stack identifies at least how I choose to break it down in the context of a blockchain-enabled world, go all the way from our real goals and the sort of macro evolution, what it is we wish to accomplish as a community, as a society, or even a small group, um, down through the agents' behaviors, the individuals' actions with respect to each other, down through the sort of interaction patterns. These are sort of 
like the ways in which one can interact with each other, um, which is different from the actions themselves, because what you can do and what you will do are actually decidedly different. And finally, getting down into the technical layers, we're you know, discussing this at a, a blockchain conference where we have this idea that we have trusted computation, we have durable state information that can only be mutated through the trusted computation. And so we have a sort of platform in the bottom two layers for building the top three layers to sort of meet our, our collective goals. And so we can roll forward. Um, I highlight this as a slide where I kind of point out the two parts that we're really talking about then today. We're sort of setting like, okay, this technology exists, it's these peer-to-peer -peer networks, there's some software, provided they are working, understanding there's a lot to be done in that avenue, but since we're really talking about our ability to coordinate as a result of a world where these technologies exist, we're really talking about what one can do, then sort of what that implies about what one will do, and sort of how they come together to create sort of global emergent properties, which sort of take on the character that we wish to achieve, though balance is more important here than some like single global metric, right? The metric that you choose to measure your success is itself a subjective choice. So we can continue. So I want to talk about engineering and analysis or science, uh, synthesis and science, um, how we use these things to actually make progress against these kind of ideas. Um, can roll forward. Um, so I really like to highlight the importance of these two skills or techniques as being synergistic. We do them together, not, oh, I have my scientists and, and you know, analysts over here, and I have my engineers and designers and architects over here, but actually in order to proceed with um, you know, good practice, we actually need to be able to step through and sort of design and revise and sort of analyze our designs, sort of build things, analyze and iterate. Um, I, we have a pretty short time frame, so I'm going to keep it moving fast. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is sort of how I describe the emergence chasm. chasm. Um, we spent a lot of time down in this little blue V doing loops. We jump right from our big stories to our attempts to implement, and we run loops and hope we find the thing that actually emerges the desired properties. But coming from an engineering discipline where we contend with messy systems with lots of uncertainties and they have to work anyway. The way we resolve that problem is to start up here with our story, break it down into pieces and sort of what I'll call rigorously decomposed. Um, this often results in, again, sort of representations of sort of networks of networks or formal representations that impose structure on what you're trying to do. You get down to this layer where you're now defining components and you're able to do design iterations and design implementations and testing and loops. And then, of course, when you start piecing a bunch of parts back together, you start verifying the individual pieces and then the compositions of pieces and try to build yourself back up to a system that actually has the intended properties. And the reason why I call this the emergence chasm is because there's no way to actually make that last green arrow by like brute forcing it. It kind of either works or it doesn't, and what determines whether or not it works is in some part what happened on the left side of the green arrow. Um, you really don't want to do iterations that go up the green side and then come back across the middle. You want to be able to work your way down, carefully define what you're doing, iterate in the bottom of the V, and then sort of move up the outside. Um, this is a, not a new idea. This is literally just the engineering process carried forward to a new kind of socio-technical system, which up until this point has largely been studied, not so much implemented. And I definitely advocate for sort of small-scale prototyping, testing, sort of take ideas like the ones that we're expressing with the radical markets and actually like distill them into a well-defined prototype, iterate through it, try to get something working in a small community, and actually demonstrate its feasibility. Um, we can go forward. Um, the big thing that's challenging here is um, these sort of closed loop systems with unknown user strategies in the loop. Um, the nice thing is there are actually mathematical techniques for attacking these problems, but they're about understanding the whole reachable spaces, what can happen. They're less about what will happen and more about saying, if I design this blue box and I have some well-defined um, sort of analytical properties, I can actually make arguments about everything that can possibly happen in this system independent of the sequence of choices that are made under all of the legal actions. And that's the kind of system level sort of um, 
first properties that you can encode and actually hope to achieve and also can hope to use to validate sort of system safety against potentially undesirable emergent properties that we know a priori we wouldn't want. Unfortunately, it can't stop things from happening that you didn't think of, but it's at least a framework for moving forward. Um, we can go forward. So, you know, within, within my firm, we've been developing out both methods and tools for doing multi-stage testing all the way from the sort of ideation and design using differential equations similar to one would use for circuit design, moving forward through sort of zooming in and looking at agent-based models, eventually tying those agent-based models to actual code and actually connecting that to live agents and doing testing. This is just, a, again, nothing particularly special. It's engineering process. We can go forward. Um, the thing that I think gets lost often is that keeping theory in this loop is really important for complex systems where structure is almost as important as anything else. Like this nested idea, if you have networks made up of networks or communities of communities, et cetera, sometimes the properties of the processes have less to do with the micro-tuned parameters and more about the shape and the structure of the world. And if you don't, um, if you're not, mindful of the way that you build those structural models, you can very often get patterns of behavior that you didn't expect or fail to understand the ones you observe. Um, in this case, we just have that iteration. Um, we can keep moving forward. I think we can skip the next two slides. We don't have a ton of time. Um, I was going to return to this and talk in the context of machine learning and system identification, but I don't think we have time for the more technical discussion of how our current tools help us understand these systems, but we can talk about it offline if you're interested. Um, this sort of goes to the types of analytical tools that come from the engineering discipline that go along with design. Largely, they are um, sensitivity analysis, understanding how your choices actually are likely to influence outcomes, and um, system identification, which is about understanding from data the parts of the system that you don't know a priori. We can move forward. Um, I really apologize, we kind of ended up running with about half of the time I'd planned for, so. Um, this is probably one of the most important points that was intended for my talk, um, that engineering isn't just the capability, it's the responsibility. This is taught from day one in the engineering discipline civil engineers, mechanical engineers. They build physical things in the real world. There's a lot of uncertainty. You got people doing who knows what out on the roads. So you got people doing who knows what in all of these scenarios. But that uncertainty, those unknown unknowns, actually don't exonerate the engineers from actually doing everything they can to understand those possibilities, account for those possibilities, and build and deploy things that are, you know, we'll say, air quote, safe. But it sounds like a joke until you look at all of the things, the amazing marvels we have in the physical world. And if you actually stop to look at how those things are made, they are not simple, deterministic, oh, we know everything's going to happen systems. They're actually incredibly robust to uncertainty, including unknown unknowns. So we can move forward. Um, this kind of brings us back to our specific question about decentralized systems and this tight feedback loop between engineering and society. We're building systems now that arguably can't be undeployed, which raises the bar in terms of how much we understand them before we deploy them or the extent to which we localize our prototypes and launch test cases and measure those test cases and iterate through them. And um, these systems can have unintended consequences that are like literally opposite of what we had hoped for. Um, we can go forward. Uh, so here's a simple example. It's a minor one. I don't think it's world ending, but you've got your cars and your internet and your economics and your humans and we have ride sharing. We didn't have ride sharing for a long time. Someone had this great idea and they created it and we had a major adaptation to our transportation network. The way that people get around, at least locally, changed dramatically. Less use of uh, mass transit was a major unintended side effect. And in fact, if your coordinated goals are about congestion and pollution, we actually made things worse. And those may not be your choice of goals that you want to focus on, but we got to point out that in a lot of cases, something can have both positive and negative effects, and having a better understanding of what they are is part of um, proper engineering um, when we take into account this sort of responsibility aspect. So um, we can jump forward. Um, this is where I sort of briefly brought up this idea that 
we make subjective choices about objective measures all the time. And I think this is a really big thing for us to think about when we're designing systems. Like, what objective measures did we encode into these systems? And what is the impact of those? What is the impact of using a different one? What's the impact of having more than one? I actually am a big proponent of systems that minimally presuppose the interpretation of data, especially when you have composable decentralized systems. The more that the systems layer and build on each other, and the lower layers make make minimal assumptions about the use of the their use in higher level systems, the more collectively adaptive your system becomes. Um, I would argue that having a token on every protocol is kind of counterproductive because it's harder to compose things, but I understand that it's currently a practicality of like launching and fundraising these protocol development uh, projects, but strictly speaking, you know, we probably prefer something where we don't need as many intermediate tokens and that building uh, systems up on the lower level systems presupposes even less. Um, I will point out, this is one of my favorite little drawings. I always sort of assume some level of heterogeneity in a successfully designed and implemented and realized system. Um, we're gonna always assume that a lot of what, observe, what comes out is emergent and less of it is actually engineered. So we can move forward. Um, this is one of the topics that I think should be discussed more often than it is. There's a real strong um, asymmetry between the way a society or a community experiences risk and the way an individual does. And I think this is, uh, these are from Talib, and they're really poignant in the sense that, you know, the community can be thought of as an ensemble, and this is how most decision science sort of literature is derived, versus the individual making decisions in the same environment is actually subject to the sort of individual outcome of their decisions. And so the exact same logic, the smart contract rules or the even the laws, if they're constructed from this paradigm, might actually be really unfair to the individual participants by forcing them to play a game that's individually bad, but globally good. So I think it's really important to, when we discuss um, engineering these systems, actually be able to take multiple paradigms and look at it both from the individual and from the aggregate perspective, and possibly even from the intermediate aggregate perspectives if we have a properly structured view of the world where we would expect these intermediate communities to emerge. Um, we can go forward. Um, I, I think this is another really critical point. So I apologize, we've sort of reduced to me making a bunch of really separate points. But um, this one is another really important one. That is when we're evaluating the fairness of, of these systems, that's really at the algorithms level, not at the outcomes level. Um, and I consider this to be similarly equivalent to the veil of ignorance if you're applying it properly. Basically, it means you analyze your system as designed precisely from the I don't know where I'm going to be and what's the overall you know, fairness of all possible outcomes under reasonable assumptions about the distribution of the population under that system. You can literally take an algorithmic approach that is equivalent to this type of study precisely because of the level of abstraction in the design. And so I think there's more room to flesh out here, but I'd like to highlight it for people who are building systems and make sure that we're asking questions about um, where, sort of, how our algorithms relate to the population from a um, sort of lack of knowledge of which participant you are, which is maybe not quite the case from systems that heavily, heavily prioritize early adopters because you're kind of saying, well, I know that I'm an early adopter, therefore my system is engineered to be great for early adopters. You know, how fair is that to the people? The end of the spectrum in steady state say, um, well, I think it remains to be determined. Um, forward one more. Um, Slides, cool. Um, I'm gonna, you can keep going forward. I think I'm gonna try to wrap up. Um, go forward, oh, let's use this one. So this is one of the most important points, also in terms of what we think about the role of governance in engineering systems. So an engineered system is always gonna need some maintenance. In this world, we're kind of imagining that maintenance is adaptive, and that's a big part of where um, these governance processes, voting processes come in. Um, sort of meaningful solutions to not simply letting control fall into a handful of groups. You can click forward. Um, click forward. So this is kind of technical. One more. 
This is the last slide. So I'll just tell you, I've been, the last two slides were a little bit of a, uh, it was meant to be a handoff to connect into what people here have been working on. This is a little toy model that I made in a rapid prototyping tool that represents a continuous voting process using uh, both a continuous time discounted weighting accumulation and also a quadratic cost. And it just basically shows a dynamic decision making process where you get this noisy set of preferences down on the bottom weighted by the token holdings, assuming there are some kind of representation of voting power um, combined with the sort of convex diminishing returns for voting, then the accumulation in time makes it so that the decision point's not fixed in time. Rather, at any point, if the sort of time-weighted quadratic cost vote crosses the line, this max function between the um, conviction flips and the decision changes. I'm a particularly a huge fan of systems that don't have discrete moments in time where things switch, which is actually an important property of the um, sort of the cost model, right? It says like, well, if at any time someone is able to sort of step in and purchase from you the thing that you have broadcast your value of through the tax you pay, that actually separates the decision from a distinct point of time. And actually as a controls engineer, this is a really, really critical property from, um, from a system design perspective. And um, so I wanted to make a, an example of using this for a more general voting context, not just for the um, sort of the cost for property. And uh, obviously a toy model, maybe, uh, maybe I can convince uh, Simon to let us use this voting model for autonomous, but I'll leave it at that. 